Uh, hey there, Josh. How you doing? I'm doing well, Glenn. I'm uh, I'm in uh, California. You're on the other side of the world. I am. By means of amazing amazing technology, I am in Calcutta uh, on holiday, uh, and uh, we are talking live. It's uh, what is it? Uh, Six thirty in the morning here. It's uh, five p.m. I gather in the afternoon where you are. Yeah. I'm very yeah. happy to be talking to you. This is Glenn Lowry, by the way, of bloggingheads.tv, The Glenn Show, and also Brown University. And I'm talking with Joshua Cohen of um, Apple University and uh, the UC Berkeley Law School. Um, we're old friends. We've done this a fair amount. And we are here to talk about... And Boston Review. And Boston Review. Uh, thank you very much, Josh. <laughs> yeah. uh, editor yes. of Boston Review, the uh, cutting-edge journal of uh, politics and culture. Uh, that Josh has been editing for a quarter century, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. Uh, yeah. And uh, it's definitely worth people's attention if it's not on their screen already. Uh, Josh, here we are. Uh, according to my reading of the online uh, New York Times, Donald J. Trump was put over the top in the Electoral College by the Texas electors and is now officially uh, the president of uh, elect to take office on January 20th, if I'm not mistaken, of the United States of America. And um, that at least uh, merits being mentioned here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can we move on to something else? <laughs> yeah. so, Who to thunk it? You know, you uh, and I started Blogging Heads. In fact, you introduced me to the Blogging Heads site way back when, uh, 2007, uh, Barack Hussein Obama was just getting his primary campaign underway. Um, yeah. I think we actually did a session here on election night or something like that in 2008. And I know we did one on his first State of the Union address. Yeah. And uh, so here we are now uh, at the end of an era uh, and uh, on the um, uh, threshold of a new era. And uh, I'm glad you're my friend, Josh, because the world is getting complicated and frightening, and we need yeah. each other. <laughs> we do need each other. It's not a. It's not a. It's uh, not not a happy day. The Russian ambassador to Turkey killed uh, a bunch of people killed in uh, Berlin by a truck bomber. Somebody from Pakistan. I think that's at least the current identification of the person um 2016 has been a very uh, very tough year so it's good to have friends <laughs> yeah 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 i only learned from you before we started recording this conversation about the uh, assassination of the russian ambassador in uh, ankara that is a terrifying omen uh it seems to me um uh, the uh, purported uh, motivation was uh, revenge for the role that Russia is playing in slaughtering people in Aleppo and like places. Yes, yes, that's that. That's again. I, I'm I'm so a little I, I I'm I'm a little reluctant to get into the details only yeah. because I don't I, I you know it's I, but that's my that's my understanding. That's how it's all been. Uh, you know how it's all been reported. I don't have any reason to uh, doubt the reporting, other than the general skepticism about reporting that is, you know, always warranted. So, but that's my, uh, that, that's my understanding. Yeah. Let me you know, propose, not, let me propose an agenda for our conversation here. Um, uh, prospective, uh, God help us, uh, what's going to happen next in terms of governance in the United States. Uh, it's a reality. Trump is going to be president. Uh, the cabinet that he's been, um, uh, appointing is uh, in all likelihood, most of them, nearly all of them, maybe all of them going to take office. Uh, and we are going to enter upon a new era in American governance. So prospective, retrospective, it's eight years of Obama. It's coming to a close. It is the end of an era. A lot of assessments are being offered. Many, many more will be forthcoming. Um, yeah. And then I have something, and I don't know if you're interested in this, but uh, this idea about Kind of how is it? Uh, how does one conduct oneself ethically uh, in the aftermath of the election of Trump? Uh, in terms of resistance, protest, demonstration, and so on like that. So what to do? Activism, but also in terms of relationships with people. I mean, I've I've uh, yes. noticed how fragile they have uh, become, and how friendships, you know, can be sundered. I mean, it just 
I was uh, talking with Harold Pollock. I think you know Harold Pollock, uh, yeah. the uh, yeah. scholar at the University of Chicago. Um, and, um, you know, it's like uh, uh, you, you know, uh, if, if, if I say something like um, uh, give Trump a chance, and I'm not saying it, I'm just saying hypothetically. If I say, let's see, let's see what's going to happen. Yeah, let's let's you know, let's keep our powder dry. Let's kind of, you know, maybe you can work here, there. You know, let's see what's going to happen. Uh, my dear friend Harold, you know, uh, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but uh, I can hear him, you know, saying, "Give him a chance." What the hell are you talking about? Give him a chance. This is the worst thing that's ever happened to the republic. Blah 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 blah. If I get a call from somebody who says, well, you come down to Washington, I haven't gotten that call, but it could happen and talk to us about, I don't know what, what we're going to do to, you know, fix the black community. We'd really like your input, you know, and I go to a few meetings with some of these characters, uh, uh, Ben Carson or, you know, some of these characters and it gets out. I mean, I don't know if uh, anybody's going to invite me to a dinner party in Cambridge anymore. <laughs> you know, they're going to say I've sold out. And uh, I just You'd have to come back out to San Francisco, Glenn. I, I would still have you for dinner. <laughs> anyway, I'm not quite sure how to frame it, but I, I think you get the idea of what I'm what I'm trying to hint at. Yeah. How do we conduct ourselves ethically in this uh, era uh, where, uh, you know, feelings are still really quite raw, where differences. I mean, you and I and I'll stop and let you talk. You and I had yeah. this uh, thing in the last time we talked here on Blogging Heads where I tried to say, uh, well, you know, we've got immigration laws. Maybe we should enforce yeah. them. And you started telling me about your dear friend who you don't want to see deported. And I don't want to see him deported either. But, man, all I was trying to do was to say yeah. we got immigration yeah. laws. You know. <laughs> so anyway, you let, see what I'm let saying. Me start, let me start with that one because a bunch of the people who watch, you, I don't know if you, how often you look at the comments, I look, but I looked I at some of the comments that people yeah. wrote. And, uh, and a few people took me to task for my yeah. uh, response to you. And uh, first of all, I have to say, I thought the comments generally were, were are great. Uh, it's really an interesting bunch of people who watch it and including the people who are criticizing me. I thought I thought there was a fair point they were making. People thought that you were asking a, you know, a reasonable political, you know, political ethical question about uh, borders and about immigration. Right. And I was kind of lashing out at you. And I think it was partly um, a, a kind of I had a it was partly w w without you know rehearsing everything. It partly was that I had misunderstood your uh, the, the thrust of the question. I thought you were talking about the issue in very sweeping terms. And I was really what I wanted to say was, Let's not be quite so sweeping and sure. talk about in, abs in the abstract about people who are in the country illegally. I was talking about somebody who'd been here for a certain amount of time, who was working. It's, I, really, what I was making was uh, what came across, and, and I was criticized for this, I think, to some extent, fairly as a kind of an, you know, an emotional, personal point. I was really making a point about the analytics of the issue that it was important to, it was important to divide it up. But I, and, 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 it, and that may have come across as my attacking, you know, the person answer, asking the question that is you. Uh, and <laughs> I certainly didn't mean to be, uh, doing that. I do think it's a fair question. My, I have to tell you, I spend, and I think I mentioned, I mentioned this to you. I spend a fair amount of time on social media, including both Twitter and Gab. Gab is the, the social media, relatively new social media forum. It's the conversation on it is dominated by people on the, uh, on the right, the alt right, the old Gab. right. It's the first time Gab, I'm hearing Gab, about it. I'm, I'm way behind the curve on this, but Gab. Okay. And, uh, it's completely open. You have to get you, you apply and they in, invite you in. And, and, and it's not there are no there, there are no ideological tests or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, it's that there's a limited amount of space and it's in beta, et cetera, et cetera. But I and I, I, I am like one of the two, you know, like the only person I've seen there who is uh, politically on uh, the, on the left. left. And nobody pays any attention to me there. I don't give a shit about what I have to say. <laughs> but but uh, there I do, you know, I try to engage uh, with people who I think have completely loathsome uh, political views and the same on Twitter. Now, uh, and I think it's important to do that. And, and I have to tell you, I've gotten, you know, to go to back to your earlier point, 
I've gotten some criticism from people. Why are you being so respectful? You know, why are you treating that? Well, you know, why? Uh-huh. You know, these people are. Uh, you know, there's this guy. I mean, not just race. I mean, racism is old fashioned. This is a white supremacists. Yeah. The, you know, vile misogynists, and all of which is true. I mean, people who are. Yeah. But um, I think it's it's important to engage, uh, partly uh, because I I don't. I, you know, I hate the sin and love the sinner. I think it's important to be open to the idea that, you know, somebody might, you might say something that would lead somebody to change their mind. And also you might learn something. You might learn something yourself. And I think this, uh, you know, balkanization, balkanization is, you know, too fancy a word for it. This incredibly, divided, embittered, um, inability for, uh, people to even, uh, talk about stuff to explore possibly. I think it's, I know you think this and, uh, it's, I think it's really disastrous. And, and, and for me, what it means is, you know, reaching out at sometimes to people who I think are really, you know, I don't know, dangerous, uh, you know, um, I talked to Richard Spencer on Twitter a little bit. Um, you know, he's my idea of a guy who's got great ideas for the future of the country. But, uh, you know, I think for the two reasons that I mentioned, you hope you may say something that'll move somebody a little bit. And sometimes you might learn something. I mean, I'm not going to become a white supremacist or a vicious misogynist, but, you know, people have, anyway, I've learned a bunch of stuff. Um, That's so interesting. No, I mean, I'm, books have been written about this. I've read uh, one or two of them. I'm, there's a lot to say about polarization, about uh, the uh, segregated networks of communication, you know, echo chambers. We self-select who we want to hear from. We unfriend people who say stuff we don't like. It, you know, that everyone is uh, uh, mainly getting their stimulation from people who already agree with them, and that only confirms them in their uh, pre-existing opinion and hardens their attitude toward those who have different opinions. And um, I have a dear friend uh, with whom I have vigorous political discussions from time to time. And the question occurs to me, is anybody going to ever say anything that changes the other person's mind? I mean, I ask that question of myself. If you, If it's not possible for your mind to be changed upon hearing an argument or learning some information that you didn't know before, my God, that's a pretty uh, sterile uh, yeah. uh, world that one is living in. So I think yeah. we should try to push are, against that. Yeah, I think there are two things that I'd want to say about that. First of all, um, one of the things, I, you know, I, you talk to somebody who's got a view that you find so loathsome that you just, yeah, it's yeah. inconceivable that you'd adopt the view. Nevertheless, they're going to say some stuff that you might learn something from and then it's going to be challenging to you. So you're not going to become a, uh, you know, white supremacist, but you know, I, you think, well, maybe I should be thinking more about, you know, human biodiversity or, you know, there's some topic that you should engage with a little bit more. It's not that you, you it does. It, so it changes your mind in the sense that it brings something to your attention that you, you, you wouldn't have thought of otherwise. And the other thing is that, uh, you, the, the connect, you know, the communication, the connection, uh, you really, um, what you realize is, you know, there are people you disagree with really fundamentally. You, they've got views that you think of are, are pretty loathsome, but then you see, well, actually they're pretty smart. Ah. They've thought pretty hard about what they think. Um, and the, it, it's not that they're, you know, not thinking hard about the world. It's yeah. that uh, the, the, the worst that you could say about them is that they've got loathsome views. It's not, yeah. you know, they're. But then let me uh, ask you about this. And I wonder if you agree, because I detect and I could be wrong about this, but I detect an asymmetry in the extent to which the two sides left and right will repair to this uh, position, he's an idiot because he has loathsome views. So that is, will equate 
values that one um, yeah. uh, despises with the lack of the capacity of the person who ha embraces those values to reason or to be, you know, so for example, cl uh, climate denier. Now there are climate deniers. That is to say, there are people who don't, who think science is bunk, who think the world yeah. is 5,000 years old or, or yeah. whatever. But there are also yeah. people who uh, don't believe the trade-off between, uh, let's say, present uh, level of economic activity and the future generation's welfare through the mechanism of, uh, you know, affecting the uh, uh, carbon in the Earth's atmosphere, warming the globe, and uh, thereby disadvantaging future generations, warrants uh, shutting down industries or whatever. There are people who disagree yeah. about the policy implications of uh, right. the geo uh, political, uh, geo physical uh, dynamics. They're not stupid. They, nope. they simply have nope. a different weighting on the relative uh, equities. And to, to respond to people who say, no, I don't think we should have this regulation from the EPA because I don't agree with you about the trade-off, as if they were deniers, feels to me like a kind of arrogant or smug, you know, sneering yeah. at somebody. You're stupid because you don't agree with me. And, and that really is a turnoff. Right. So I think that I, I agree with you about that. And I think... Uh, um, one of the things that you do, and to put to put it bluntly, is w when you treat the person, that person who who's thought about the issue hard, who disagrees with you, and you know they may be wrong. I mean, right. thinking hard doesn't make you right, but they they may be wrong. But if you don't engage, you make yourself more stupid. I mean, to be to be very blunt about it, because you lose the opportunity. Yeah. It's you know it's the old um, you know John Stuart Mill uh, uh, point that one of the great reasons for you know, having robust, wide open uh, discussion is that, as he put it in this kind of Victorian prose, that it's good for the mental well-being of mankind on which all their other well-being depends. Brilliant, Josh. Well, I, 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 I couldn't quote, quote I couldn't quote uh, uh, John Stuart Mill, uh, but I certainly remember that argument, and I remember being uh, astounded by the uh, the profundity of it. You know, if you don't, he says, uh, if you don't uh, allow for people who are wrong uh, to engage you and argue with you, you forget about why you're right. You forget about why you're right. You lose, <laughs> you, you, you and it becomes a, a kind of ossified uh, recitation of doctrine. You know, you you know. Yeah. Dead dogma. That's yeah, his dogma, phrase. Yeah. You get dead dogma, and you lose a grip on, uh, as he puts it, both the meaning of the views that you have. They become kind of slogans, and also the grounds for them, the reasons for them. So I think there's there's real. Uh, I think there's important value. Now you started off by saying that there was an asymmetry. Because uh, I don't I see the right doing that to the same degree, and maybe I'm just missing it. Doing this. So I think, what, yeah, yeah, go ahead. yeah, I think what's happened recently, this is what I see, you know, as somebody who's, you know, kind of, a, you know, a, you know, some kind of actively engaged is I, I think you were correct. I'm not going to use the word right because we're not politically right. You were correct uh, about the state of things maybe five years ago. What I see now is that there are um Two kinds of responses from people on the on the right, and I don't mean the, you know, the Charlie Sykes, Wisconsin radio, yeah. you know, classical liberal. Uh, you know, I mean people who are more on the what's you know generally labeled the alt right. There are two kinds of things. First of all, there are the people, and these are people who I do generally shut off pretty quickly, who say, oh, you're a Jew who teaches at Berkeley. Yeah. And you know, I, I, I don't have time. You know, There's no way short. to go from there. <laughs> I, I don't have time for that. Right. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, you know, just they're like people being pests. Um, <laughs> uh, there also is, and this is, I think, different from it, there is a tendency now to um, psychologize people who are, uh, you know, li you know, people who are politically on the left, that they are so triggered that they've been made so nervous and so fretful, uh, these so-called social justice warriors that, you know, and and the kind of let's, you know, the sort of let's troll them. Yeah. And th 
it, it has all of the trappings of the kind of thing that you're describing. It's sort of strategies of dismissiveness. And, uh, you know, I think it's. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I guess I, I see what you're getting at. Uh, they say he must need a safe space now. You know, let's get him some puppies gotta, and yeah, a, yeah, have, yeah. a cup of hot yeah. cocoa and, you know, blah, blah. And, and they are being dismissive I, I, when they do and, that. And, you know, some you know, little <laughs> you know, so a doll to hold or some crayons or whatever. But, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the – but, you know, I care about this issue for people with whom I uh, – you know, I'm broadly on the same, you know, the same side. And I do think it's a, I think it's a serious problem. I think there's a lot, you know, there is this shutting off of, uh, and, and I think I, you know, I do sort of agree with, uh, I agree with Mill about it. I think it, 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 it's, it, it's facing up to these really hard challenges that keeps you firing on all cylinders. Okay, so now let's uh, go back to the agenda. Uh, retrospective, prospective. The Obama. What's what's your appraisal? We, this is you know it's the end of the Obama presidency. You, I saw something that you wrote the other day about it. What's your appraisal? Yeah. Um, so I don't think the president delivered on his promise of hope and change. Um, I think his stewardship of the Democratic Party has been. Uh, a disaster for the party, though, of course, he can't be singly held responsible for that. Nevertheless, he's the guy at the top. I think uh, much of what he's uh, accomplished hangs by a thread and is likely to be reversed. And therefore, when one looks at the uh, full scope of his impact, uh, notwithstanding the symbolic significance of a black man ascending to the presidency and notwithstanding the elegance, intelligence and uh, eloquence of, uh, of Barack Obama's conduct in office, I still think the grade's got to be C or something. Um, mm-hmm. I think his, uh, I mean, I still have this image in my mind of, uh, of him and uh, his wife uh, and his vice president, but particularly of him uh, going out on the stump for Hillary Clinton and I'm looking at the fact that a few tens of thousands of votes in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and Detroit and Milwaukee would have changed the outcome of the election. He appeals to African-Americans to cast their ballots on behalf of his designated successor. Uh, And uh, at the end of the day, the appeal falls, relatively speaking, on deaf, deaf ears. And I'm thinking that's a humiliation in a way. And that's a that's that's kind of a sad commentary on on uh, on the president's uh, uh, occupation of this symbolic office of, you know, the uh, black leader of black uh, political uh, uh, life. Uh, the people did not come out for him. Uh, so I'm I'm you know I, I know there's hagiography in the in the making. I know that the you know I read David Remnick at the New Yorker just like the next person and. Uh, Michael Eric Dyson and, you know, all this. And I know that Obama's going to be touted as one of the great presidents. You know, he's going to be up there with FDR in the minds of certain people. But I'm just not I'm not buying it. I'm not feeling it. Um, so uh, here we are. It's at the end of eight years. And I think in retrospect, it has to be said that the president failed uh, a good and a decent man who maybe wasn't entirely up to the task. I know, and I'll stop. It'll be, it'll, it'll mm-hmm. be said, well, he was never given a chance. The Republicans were dead set to defeat him. Mm-hmm. American racism, he's a black man in the office, and nobody could really, or too many people were unwilling to accept that. To which my answer is, yes, those obstacles were there. That was a mountain to climb. That was the job he signed on for. We all knew on day one that a black president was going to encounter and therefore, um, it was up to him to overcome that, okay? And I don't think in every instance, to wit, if I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon. To yeah. wit, the Cambridge police acted stupidly. To wit, yeah. Al Sharpton visiting the White House dozens of times. To wit, I could go on. I'm not sure that he managed that problem as well as he might have done. Easy for me to say, sitting here in my... Uh, you know, repose in an <laughs> elegant hotel room in Calcutta, <laughs> not having to run for anything and not having to deal with a recalcitrant Republican Congress. But uh, my grade is C, maybe even C minus. Yeah. I, I, you know, I wish I, 
I, I wish I disagreed, but I wish I disagreed if only because it would make the conversation more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, it, it's politics. This is not, a, it's the, this is not a moral judgment about him. I seem, I, I, this seems, he strikes me. I've never met him. I know people who know him well. Uh, strikes me as, you know, an ex- a person of extraordinary uh, decency, obvious, you know, the extraordinary intelligence, um, uh, you know, a kind of depth of integrity that's, uh, you know, stands in sharp contrast to some other people who are now p- prominent figures on the political scene, <laughs> uh, the, the next president. Yeah. Uh, the contrast couldn't be sh- humanly, the contrast couldn't be uh, sharper. Um, so from a moral point of view, from the, uh, from the point of view of, uh, of, uh, you know, a kind of fidelity to his, who he is, he didn't try to be something other than what he is, but, you know, it's politics and consequences are important. And at the end of the day, uh, here's the grade. Donald Trump won. I mean, that's and and that uh, is going to probably mean, as as the as President Obama said, it's probably going to mean uh, a significant damage or to or destruction of his uh, legacy, uh, the legacy of the Affordable Care Act, which has had a very considerable impact on getting people yeah. uh, health care uh, coverage. Yes, a pretty weak economic recovery by historical standards, but the economy has been steadily producing jobs uh, for, you know, six years uh, now. Um, Unemployment rate is down a lot. Uh, Lots of awful stuff happening in the world, but there are not large numbers of American soldiers uh, getting killed. So there, but you know, signature achievements are uh, have been uh, his signature achievements, and and including the Affordable uh, Care Act, have been seriously put in jeopardy. And to the, you know, what you said at the beginning, he hasn't delivered on the promise of hope and change. I don't think he's delivered on the promise of hope and on the promise of change. Unfortunately, you know, there has been change, but it's not the kind of change that he was talking about. I think the 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 political culture is eating itself alive. Um, uh, and, you know, this is all, I, you know, this is judging him by, or the his presidency by a, lo- a large number of things over which he had almost no control. As you said, uh, in, uh, yes, a, a recalcitrant is putting it too gently, uh, yeah. a, you know, a hostile, uh, a hostile Republican Party, uh, a great deal of uh, racial resentment, large numbers of people in the hostile Republican Party who say that he's not a citizen of the United States, a successor as president who said that he wasn't b- insisted for years that he wasn't born in the United States, large numbers of people who say, well, he says he's a Christian, but he's really a Muslim. So there was a level of, uh, you know, hostility and opposition in trend, more than recalcitrance, intransigence on the part of the opposition. Um, All of that's true. And I don't, so I don't judge him personally. And I, in a way, don't wish that he had tried to be somebody other than who he is. I mean, he could have tried to pretend to be, you know, a street fighter. He's not a street fighter. And being a fraud is not something that I, you know, would recommend. I don't think he would have been successful if he tried to do it. But well, hold on. But just, just, excuse me for interrupting. I just want to ask, don't you yeah. have to be a street fighter in order to be effective in that particular position? I mean... It's also said uh, one of the aides. I don't remember who was quoted. We we don't do theater, you know. Yeah. In other words, we're too fastidious. We're too principled yeah. to go out and put on a flag pin or to 
you know, go through the rigmarole of, you know, play acting with the American people. Well, hell, that's what the job is. The job is this mysterious uh, alchemy of um, influence and image management and agenda uh, massaging and, and, and misleading and misdirection. And also it's the it's it's ruthlessness. It's it's cutting people's throats, uh, figuratively speaking, when it's necessary, cutting them off at the knees. Uh, that's the job. That's how you get the job done, it would seem to so me. me. So you say, yeah, don't be someone not, who he is. Well, then maybe you're in the wrong position if who you are. Is, I, I, uh, look, it, that's, a, that, that's a fair inference from what I'm saying. What uh, I, but what, Look, you go back to, I, I don't know if you've read the Caro. Uh, of uh, Johnson. Biography. I've not read that. Uh, was it a trilogy or whatever? I've not read. So, so uh, you read the story about passage of the Civil Rights Act and everything that you just said about the requirements for success in the job. I mean, they are on full display and not just the negative sides, not just the street fighting, Mm -hmm. the incredible mastery of the rules is a master of the Senate. Okay, incredible Mm -hmm. mastery of the rules, Mm -hmm. the personal relationships Mm -hmm. in addition to uh rhetorical skill and a willingness to bully and deceptive all, all of the above it is the story that caro tells about johnson and the passages of the civil rights act is one of the great arguments that i've read in defense of politics in all senses of the the, the good and the bad senses of the term a combination a rep- of seduction and extortion one might say yeah and and what I was saying about Obama, it, like Lyndon Johnson was able to do that because he was fucking Lyndon Johnson. I mean, he's been <laughs> practicing that for a long time. You can't fake that. Yeah, you can't fake that. And if you want to see yeah. somebody who's, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, has gotten in trouble for trying to be in this case to come across as who she isn't. I mean, yeah. I think it was one of the problems that that people felt with Hillary Clinton. I mean, who exactly, you know, is this person? Yeah. Is she the person who's concerned about, you know, lead paint poisoning in Flint or uh, water, uh, water and the water in Flint? Or is she concerned the person who's making speeches to Goldman Sachs? And is she the person who proposed a flag burning amendment in 2006? Yeah. Or is she the, you know, is she the person who voted against, who voted for the Iraq war? Why was she voting for the Iraq war? Was this about positioning? Was it about having neoconservative convictions? I mean, it was kind of all of the above with her. And Obama, this is what I'm saying. I think it's to his, when I think about him humanly, you know, he is who he is. He knows who he is and he acted who he is. That may not have been the skills that were required for the personality, the character, the skills that were required for doing the job. And if you and as I say, if you go back and you look at that Civil Rights Act, Johnson. And now you ask yourself. Could Obama have gotten the Civil Rights Act passed? Well, you got to say no or probably not, not based on the evidence at hand. And by the way, could Kennedy have gotten the Civil Rights Act passed? Probably not. Yes. So. You know, there we are. It's not a cheery assessment, and it has nothing to do with him as a human being, as a person. It has to do with the fit between him, the job, and the time that he was elected. Yeah, and uh, your mention about Hillary Rodham Clinton and insincerity uh, puts me in mind of William Jefferson Clinton, uh, who apparently uh, is on the other end of the spectrum with respect to his uh the coincidence of his personal qualities with what might have been required for, I mean, most of his personal yeah. qualities, personal qualities. Yeah. <laughs> what yeah. might have been required to be successful in the job. Yeah. And I guess the, the other thing that I'd say is, you know, we, we started off, this is in a, in a completely different vein, but it's, you know, still in the space of thinking about Obama and the Obama presidency. We, I started off, Last time we talked with, you know, with two observations, the first one, which, again, I think is very important, is that if you look 
in the large at the world over the past 30 years, there's a pretty remarkable record of improvement in terms of reduction of poverty, yeah. extraordinary reduction of poverty, literacy, uh, infant mortality, et cetera. Um, and, you know, if you got to be a globalist to think that's a good thing, that a lot of people in other parts of the world are doing a lot better, that there's been a real alleviation, then, you know, I think count me and I think count you, count yeah. us as globalists. If you think that that's not a great thing, and I'm not giving the on balance, but if you think that's not a great thing, there's some, I think there's some, you know, wrong with you. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, and this was the second point we talked briefly about, is you, you go to that, uh, you know, Bronco Milanovic elephant uh, curve and you see that, you know, over the past 30 years, there are extraordinary gains elsewhere in the world. And there are very considerable gains at the top of the world income distribution. And then you got a bunch of people and it happens to coincide with, you know, middle class people in wealthy countries who haven't done so well. Yeah. And one of the things I think, even rhetorically speaking, that's not been a success of the uh, Obama presidency is, you know, pointing to that group of people and saying this is this is really a, a serious um, uh, moral uh, challenge and that the that the um, gains for people in the rest of the world don't have to come at the expense of gains for people uh, in the in wealthier countries who are doing reasonably well, better than poor people in the rest of the world. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you look at the last 30 years, there was just recently a paper from uh, Piketty, Emmanuel Seiss and Gabriel Zuckman, this national income accounts paper. And one of the charts, it's really quite remarkable. If you look at the bottom 50% of the population in the past 30 years, so this is the 25 to 80 to 1980 to 2014, uh, post tax income, post tax income gains, 21%, top 0.1% post tax income gains, 300%. Well, if you go to the 0.01, then it's 600, something like that. But just take the top 0.1%. 300% post-tax gains. Over bottom, what period, uh, Josh? 1980 to 2014. Okay. Wow. Bottom 50%, 21% gain. Now compare that with uh, the previous 25-year period. So, the, you know, the period, of, you know, the, the post-war. Mm -hmm. uh, bottom 50%, 130% income gain. Top 0.1%. 104% gain. That was a period in which you built the, you know, the, the broad, uh, middle class in the United States. And, and then, and then you flip it to uh, people in those groups, including poor people, uh, but also middle class, you know, people in the 30th percentile, 40th percentile, 50th percentile, not doing so well. And there's also an incredible graph in this paper by Piketty, Seiss, and Zuckman, 1962 to 2014, pre-tax labor income for men, flat. 1962, 50 years, pre-tax labor income for men, flat. Well. And what I think is that I mean, both Obama and Clinton had lots of policies, but I think calling out this issue, the inequality issue, both as a domestic issue and as a global issue, you know, that is that the gains elsewhere came at the expense of losses in the United States for those people, but not losses for people at the top. Yeah. You know? yeah. I think there's a real, I think also, uh, you know, aside from everything else, I think it's a real rhetorical failure there. Yeah, that's very powerful. I, it, it's very powerful to me. Just fun. Hmm? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, I was just going to say, I mean, you, you've said a number of things here that I think are really important. I mean, uh, this observation that as human beings on a planet of 7 billion people to see poverty rates falling in India and China such as they have done, 
uh, and not to feel that that's a real gain for humanity and something that is an, an alloyed benefit. Uh, there's, there's something just wretched about the ethics of a person who wants to, you know, I mean, my main objection to America first as a slogan is we're 5% of the world's population. We're going to be the tail wagging the dog here. Um, but the other thing I think is that uh, in, virtu in, in, in view of the fact that globalism or globalization uh, creates losers uh, in the middle class and the rich yeah. countries, um, it, it's not enough to um, simply point the finger at a few billionaires and say, you know, the billionaires are, uh, I mean, it, it's a kind of systemic problem in which we have to somehow say, um, do you, you know this, uh, this book by Danny Roderick, uh, The Globalization yeah. Paradox? Uh, yeah, the trilemma. Yeah. Yeah, the tri exactly. The trilemma. You got democracy, you got nationalism, and you got globalization. And there's a real problem with those three things going together because globalization produces losers within the nation state and democracy allows those losers to, you know, to speak up for themselves and to block it. We don't want to impoverish the, the developing countries by uh, retreating to a kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, a drawbridge uh, uh, economy. But we really do have to deal with the losses uh, uh, of the you know, marginalization of our own people. Flat wages in the middle class for a half century? I mean, Among God. men, pre-tax wages, 50 years. It's, I, I just, it's, you know, it's stunning. Yeah. And, 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 and I think I'm with you. Ameri if America first means that I should think that I should be indifferent it's not, it doesn't say America only, but it's America first. It means I should be indifferent to or dismissive of the, these gains elsewhere in the world that for the first time in human history, fewer than 10 percent of the world's population lives, uh, you know, if, if fewer than 10 percent are living in extreme poverty. If I'm supposed to think, hey, whatever. Uh, well, that, that's a loathsome uh, position, it's a loathsome position. But at the same time, if I'm supposed to say Hey, there were these, there was this economic growth and we'll get a little, you know, we'll do a little economic jargon here. We got this Caldor Hicks standard that says you got a welfare gain, objectively speaking, if you have a change that enables you to compensate people. Yeah. P potential compensation. Okay. You got a welfare gain. Yeah. But. They're not, they don't get the compensation. The whole reason for making the changes was not to give them compensation. Well, you know, uh, that's. Yeah, well, the welfare that's, gain. That's the, wretched, too. That's morally wretched, too. The welfare gain comes out of the economics of the uh, situation, but the compensation comes out of the politics of, of the exactly. situation. Ex exactly. The compensation comes out of the politics. And where to go back to this point about the rhetor this rhetorical deficiency, and I don't mean rhetorical only because it's also a, poli a political and a policy problem, mm -hmm. but even from a rhetorical point of view, I think what's happened is it's made, it's become very hard right now for somebody, for a politician in the United States to say, you know what I think? I think it's great that people in other parts of the world <laughs> are making more money. I think it's great that literacy rates are up. I think it's great that mortality, that infant, infant mortality. mortality. Is, yeah. It's a, all of that's really great. <clears throat> Uh, the problem is that the way this has come about is been that it's been at the expense of, uh, unnecessarily at the expense of people, uh, in this, uh, country. And I think what's happened is it's, be I mean, if you take even, you know, Bernie Sanders, I think on this issue about, you know, the, you know, call it a global gains, I think he was kind of weak on that issue. Um, yeah. I think, and I think that's a partly a legacy of Obama. Anyway. Yeah, listen, I, I want us to uh, do a little bit on this perspective, and maybe it ties into some of the things that have already been said. So uh, protest and resistance going forward. Uh, and uh, President Obama's role in his post-presidency as, uh, I don't know what, leader of a loyal opposition or something like that. Uh, just a just a comment. The president has yeah. been magnanimous. I think we can say that in his defeat. Yeah. Uh, he has tried to make himself available to and helpful to uh, the incoming administration. He's instructed his 
staff and uh, cabinet heads and so forth to, you know, open their uh, door and, and to facilitate a orderly transition such as had been done on his behalf uh, by the George W. Bush administration. But there are many, some of them are our friends, who are disappointed that the president has been magnanimous in this way. And I'm thinking about what you just said a moment ago, which is uh, Barack Obama has to be Barack Obama. He can't be somebody else. And it's very Obama-esque, isn't it, that uh, one would be magnanimous in defeat, one would worry about the institutions, one would uh, tell Hillary Rodham Clinton on election night that it's time for her to concede and other such things like that in the interest of the country um, and so on. Um, but uh, uh, I don't ex – here's what I want to say. I don't expect to see him um, uh, get out front – uh, nip at the heels of uh, Trump, even when it warrants uh, nipping at, um, to uh, try to galvanize some kind of uh, broad movement of resistance and, um, and opposition. I expect him to be graceful and, uh, and magnanimous in his post-presidency. And I think that's going to disappoint an awful lot of people. I wonder what you think about that. Uh, I think you're right uh, that that's how he'll be, and because that, that's who he is. Um, and I don't exactly recommend that he be different <laughs> from that. Insincerity is not a good thing. I think you're absolutely right that he'll disappoint uh, lots of people in the way that he's disappointed people for not being the fighter that he's not the uh, fight. Um, and uh, I think um, people should focus their attention elsewhere than on whether they're happy with or disappointed in his role. He has, he's going to have to make some judgments. He's in a very unusual, unique position. He's the guy who's just left the uh, uh, presidency. Uh, and I th think he's not the political leader of the, you know, the, the liberals and progressives and the left going forward. And, uh, I think people are going to have to focus on um, issues about building up uh, electoral, a long-term strategy, building up electoral strength, starting for 2018, but you know, going forward from there. The situation of the of Democrats, whether you know conservative Democrats <coughs> or progressive Democrats in the states, is a total disaster. A complete, you know, it's not like there's this welling up of strength. There's, uh, there are some groups, uh, our revolution, the National Leadership Council. There are some groups that are, yeah. that are, that are focused on the future, but, uh, and, you know, and I think people are going to have to do some things that, you know, are, 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 are uncomfortable for Democrats and, and for pr progressive people on the left who are used to focusing on national power. I think they're going to need to spend lots of time you know, building up local strengths and foundations, running for local offices, running for city council, running for state. Uh, you know, I think the example of California will probably be, you know, exempt will be exemplary in some ways. You have a state that's uh, the economy's in pretty decent shape, uh, the environment is in pretty decent shape, the bu state budget is in pretty decent shape. Uh, it would be nice if the universities were getting a little bit more money from the state, but that's normal politics. No. Uh, so I think that that if for me, uh, when I think about my engagement going forward over the next five years uh, politically, I'm not going to pay much attention to Obama, I don't think. And I don't say that in disparagement or in criti or criticism at all. I just think having been president, he has a very deep sense of the special role of the position that he's going to be in. And he, he doesn't think of it, I don't think, he doesn't think of it as, you know, a leader of the political opposition going forward. And I don't think other people should be thinking of it that way or judging him by whether he's effective in that role. They should be looking elsewhere. And what about resistance? Um, you know, what about uh, Obama saying if uh, Trump succeeds, the country succeeds, we want to help him succeed. But a, a lot of partisans saying um, we're going to block him at every turn because, God damn it, he's Trump. And moreover, they blocked Obama. Let's block him, too. As if two wrongs you know, added up to a right for the country. 
Right. So, you know, it was uh, uh, Limbaugh, Rush Limbaugh, with Mitt Romney's uh, approval, who said, I hope uh, Obama fails. Yeah. Um, don't want him to succeed. Look what he wants to do. I don't want him to succeed. That's political rhetorical bullshit to say, hope the president succeeds. Um, I uh, I think that I I think I said this last time. I I have generally thought that uh, Sanders has hit the right notes on this. Yeah. He said things like, if the guy wants to do something serious on infrastructure, I'm, I'm going to be, you know, in the, I want to be part of that conversation. Uh, I don't think he's going to do something that Sanders is going to very, be very happy with on infrastructure, but that's, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see where that goes. Uh, on issues about the views about Muslims, uh, on issues about race, on issues about women, uh, you know, where I'm, I don't, I didn't saying anything good and I don't want to <laughs> give him a chance, uh, cause mm-hmm. it's all what he said. I'm going to take him at his word. I'm going to take him mm-hmm. seriously and literally. And I'm going to, you know, it seems really bad. Well, let me so just I press think, on that point for a minute. I, I agree. Okay. Sanders, I, for me too, hits the right note. If it's something that I think is a good thing, let me help him succeed. If it's something that I disagree with and think is contrary to my values, then I'm going to oppose him. What if he tries to pivot? Are we going to let him pivot? I mean, maybe this is more of a question for journalists and opinion writers, but you know what I mean? Suppose he tries to grow in office. Are we going to deny the possibility that he can grow in office? You you know what I mean? Suppose he tries to revise Uh, what he's going to say. Are we going to then throw his words back at him and say, I thought you were a fascist. Act like a fascist, goddammit. Don't try to be a decent person who actually leads the country in a decent. We're not going to allow you to become a quote Ronald Reagan close quote, no matter what you do. You, know, you see what I'm getting? Yeah. At? Um, I, 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 um, I know you're interested in the conversion phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, I am. I, I think the awesome responsibilities of that office might break through uh, the narcissism and self-absorption even of a Donald J. Trump. I'm prepared to allow that that can happen. Um, I believe I am. I don't know if I believe in miracles. I think it would be <laughs> if it happened. I, there is no evidence at all. None from that I know that at least that I know of from his history or from the testimony of people who've known him for a long time. Or I'm, if I may say, from the testimony I know of somebody who saw him at a meeting last week and his, um, uh, I, I won't say who the person was and I won't say what the circumstances sure. of the meeting were. I will just say that this person was that he or she was absolutely back on his or her heels, that it was a, a, a miserably horrible day. And this is wow. somebody I mean, really horrible somebody. And this is somebody who's been in public service. And, uh, you know, serious public service and and just thought, uh, it was, it was really one of the worst days of his or her life. I'm very Uh, sorry to hear that. Yeah. And, uh, and it it was, it was awful. So, so, you know, I don't want to rule anything out but i would be tend to think of it more in in the more concrete way that sanders has been than in this very abstract way if he changes if he converts what would we do i would say more like you know here are some things that he's talking about i'm going to be opposing him that you know those things absolutely here are some other things that he said i'm prepared to listen on those things now sanders could say i suppose he could say if he suddenly were to change his tune on, you know, uh, on the issues about Muslims, if he were to, if you know, if Flynn were to change, uh, well, okay, but that seems so improbable. I wouldn't be preparing myself for that eventuality. It just mentally or organizationally, it's so improbable. It just seems like a, a you know, a metaphysical possibility, not something that you want to build any kind of politics around. 
So I, I think the thing to build politics around is you make the assumption that there are going to be future elections in the United States, you know, you know, and uh, that they're going to be partisan contests for office, that the Democratic Party, uh, both in its more progressive wing and other parts of it is ba- very much uh, is really in a deep, profoundly weakened state. It's a weakened state organizationally and a weakened state ideologically. And uh, you should that people should focus on what needs to be done to to rebuild that strength, keeping the eyes on the prize that this that it's a political democracy and that a lot happens if you win elections. All right, Josh, uh, I'm going to let that be the last word. Really good yeah. talking to you. Good to talk to you, Glenn. All right. All take right. care. Take care.